Good afternoon, friends and fellow citizens. Welcome to the May 10th, 2018 board meeting of the Prince George's County Board of Education. Uh, before we begin, as always, I would like to remind everyone to turn off your wireless devices or put them on vibrate so that they do not interfere with the taping of the meeting. And I'd ask Ms. Eubanks to please lead us in the board prayer and pledge of allegiance. Please rise. Oh God, we pray to administer that which is just in all educational policies, being ever mindful of your guidance. Steer us to action with love, wisdom, and understanding. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Ms. Eubanks. Mrs. Berkeley, would you please call the roll? Good afternoon, board members. Good afternoon. Ms. Ahmed? Here. Ms. Boston? Present. Mr. Burroughs? Here. Ms. Eubanks? Here. Ms. Hernandez? Mr. Murray? Ms. Page. Here. Mrs. Quinteros Grady. Ms. Roche. Present. Mr. Valentine. Mr. Wallace. Present. Mrs. Williams. Present. Dr. Wiseman. Present. Dr. Eubanks. Present. Thank you, Mrs. Berkeley. Let's. Uh, Keep our friend Curtis Valentine in our thoughts. He is sick today. Hopefully he gets well soon. Uh, colleagues, I would please ask for a motion to adopt the agenda for May 10th, 2018 board meeting. So moved. It's been moved and seconded to adopt the agenda. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed. Thank you, that motion carries. Colleagues, may I have a motion to adopt and approve the April 24th, 2018 board meeting minutes? It has been moved and seconded to adopt the minutes. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed? Thank you, that motion carries. Colleagues, we will now have a news break entitled, A Launch Pad for Science. Eight, seven, six, five. It was only a simulation, but for the students in Challenger Learning Center's mission control, the launch of an orbiting satellite had the feel of the real thing. <laughs> With rockets at their fingertips and rock samples ready for analysis on a mock space station, the astronauts for a day were experiencing immersive science at its best inside of one of Prince George's County's best kept secrets, the Howard B. Owen Science Center in Lanham. Opened in 1978 and now celebrating its 40th anniversary, the Owen Center annually welcomes nearly 30,000 wide-eyed students from pre-K through high school, all arriving by bus and none worried about being graded. With dancing robots, plumbing puzzles, astronomic wonders, and a menagerie full of menacing creatures who really just want to be friends, Owen's is a magical place where phobias are conquered and science gets real. Since everybody touched it, I was like, okay, then I'm going to go ahead and touch it too because, I mean, I was thinking that I wanted to get a pet turtle now. When I first started working here, one of the programs, Digging Into the Past, requires picking up a chameleon. And I wasn't really, you know, too into that. But then once I actually had the opportunity to become acclimated and to 
become friends with the chameleon <laughs> and understand it. Yeah. He's a pretty cool chameleon. So I even named him. His name is Majesty. And now that's what everybody calls him. He's my buddy. When I was in middle school at um, Robert Goddard, right around the corner, we came over. We used to walk because it's right, you know, right back there. And so we had this... Um, session it had to do with computers or something that was my first time using a computer and so the screen was um, green mm -hmm. and we printed our little stories we typed up a story we were working in partners and um, typed up our story on a dot matrix printer <laughs> oh my gosh just telling my age a little bit and while all 47 of Owen's programs adhere to state and national curriculum standards there is nothing standard about them Take the Buck Lodge Middle School students playing the roles of CSI forensic detectives. For 90 minutes, their classroom became a crime lab as they tested suspicious powders, any one of which could be, in real life, an illegal drug. But the first thing we want to do is look at them. They are white powders. But maybe even looking at them, they look a little different. So I have a flashlight at the station. You can take the flashlight and shine it on them. Some of them are going to be shiny, and some will look more like glass. Going on simultaneously, a group of C.T. Reed elementary students in another classroom discovered that their robotics class was, in fact, very animated. Watching them program their Ozobots to light up, knock down baby bowling pins, and yes, dance the cha-cha to matching music was to witness discovery at its best. Here we go, Ozo cha-cha. And in yet one more classroom, would-be hydraulic engineers from Vansville Elementary attempting to build a watertight water wall interpreted an unexpected splashdown as a signal to head back to the drawing board and maybe <laughs> tighten a few more clamps. That's okay. Give yourself a hand. That's your first try. What would you do after, you, after the first time? What would you do? Secure it and do what? And do it over again. Do it over again. The hope of it all is that a child's one day at Owens will be both a souvenir experience and perhaps an epiphany, a glimpse of where a young life might be headed. And we definitely want them to leave them enthused uh, for science and for STEM education, uh, science, technology, and uh, engineering and math, and also to be considered careers in those fields. Whether they become STEM scientists or not, the late Howard B. Owens would be thrilled that 40 years after his dream of a science center came true, youngsters still delight in understanding the world a little better. This was awesome, Miss Ray. Thank you so very much. I learned so much today. I actually got to touch a snake for the very first time, Miss Ray. Thank you so much. It's that interaction. Are you having fun here this morning? Yes, so much fun. <laughs> I can tell you're having fun. Uh, there's a lot of responsibility. You're going into space. <laughs> Did you ever think that would happen? No. Oh, my goodness. I'm kind of scared in a little bit, but, you know, I'm, I'm going to make it. You know? I know you're going to make it. Would you yourself like to really go into space someday after having done this? Yes. Oh, gee, I want to see the stars and the planets and the sun. You're a star yourself. Thank you. The Howard B. Owen Science Center, a launch pad to the stars for all the stars in Prince George's County. Happy anniversary, Owen Science Center! Yay! This is Dave Zier. Thank you for that wonderful report, the great work that we are doing uh, with Prince George's County Public Schools in producing the leaders of tomorrow, particularly uh, our scientists who will um, uh, help to save the planet and give us the food and the resources we need to be successful and maybe even go into space. So thank you so much for that great report. And I will now move on to the uh, chair's report begin my remarks this afternoon as always by honoring the memory of, uh, of lives lost uh, and people loved uh, and um, want to first especially 
uh, uh, acknowledge and ask us to keep our thoughts and prayers on the family of Baltimore County Executive Kevin Kamenetz, who died tragically and suddenly of a heart attack uh, today. Uh, he is one of the true heroes and leaders and public servants of our generation, uh, particularly here in the state of Maryland. So our thoughts and our prayers uh, go with him and his family uh, and our fellow citizens in Baltimore County. Um, I also want to give thoughts and prayers to the family of Dolores Tillman, secretary at Oxon Hill High School, uh, and ask at this time that you join me in a moment of silence in remembering both of their meaningful lives. Thank you so much. Friends, I hope those of you who paid attention to the fact that this is Teacher Appreciation Week uh, and that we've all spent time thanking uh, those who do work tirelessly every day uh, on behalf of our students uh, and the families that they serve. Uh, uh, some folks don't know that I spent 30 years of my professional career working with, for, and on behalf of the great teachers of this nation. Uh, and whether it was working tirelessly to help to ensure that we had more black and, and Latino teachers in America's public schools, to making sure that our new teachers got the support that they deserved, to making sure that our, um, that our accomplished teachers uh, and National Board Certified Teachers and other great teachers gave schools and school districts and the nation the leadership that it deserves because we know deeply that teachers have the answers to most every problem and challenge we face in public education. Uh, and so uh, I, I uh, thank the teachers of Prince George's County Public Schools um, and give uh, special thanks and ask all of you to remember those teachers in your lives who made a difference uh, to you and helped you get here today. So absolutely thank you uh, for that. Um, and uh, my colleague, Sonia Williams, sent me a super cool tweet today that John White tweeted out. Tweeted out, he tweeted, he tweeted out. He treated us with a tweet. <laughs> About the first graduating class of Duval High School's aerospace engineering and aviation technology program. This is Duval's program. And these students who are graduating this year earn nearly $1 million in scholarship offers to school. So let's give them a great round of applause. That's the kind of unsung success that we must always remember and celebrate and keep up front Mr. at Chair, all times. Can I add? I, I, knew, I knew you was going. I knew, you, I knew I couldn't stop you. And it's you. not even in District 9. <laughs> okay. But this is what great by choice looks like when our students achieve this kind, this kind of acknowledgement and they receive this kind of scholarship offers. This is what great by choice looks like. So let's celebrate them Absolutely. and, and see, hope that others try to duplicate this effort. Absolutely. And look up that tweet. It has a great uh, YouTube video uh, of some students talking about their success as well. So definitely do look up that tweet. Thank you, John, for keeping that front and center. Um, upcoming announcements. We meet again on June 7th, 2018 at 5 p.m. And then on June 21st, 2018 at 7 p.m. Those meetings of the board are held at the SASA building here in the boardroom. Persons interested in speaking at meetings of the board must register using our online registration tool found on the PGCPS website under the board tab. Click the quick links tab that reads public participation in board meetings and hearings and register. We register on a first come first serve basis starting four business days prior to the scheduled meeting up until two and a half hours prior to the scheduled start time. If you don't have access to online technology, you may absolutely still call the board office to register at 301-952-6115. That concludes my chair's remarks, and I will yield the floor to Dr. Maxwell for 
a report from the Chief Executive Officer. Thank you, Dr. Eubanks, members of the board, uh, uh, people here in the boardroom and, and uh, following us on television. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, acknowledge that uh, former uh, Board of Education member Kathy Birch is here uh, with us this afternoon. I appreciate having you here. I've known Ms. Birch for a very long time and uh, just wave or, you know, something, you know. <laughs> Um, we had students uh, in this past week, you know, there was a state uh, visit. Uh, the president of France uh, came here to the United States, and we had students from our French immersion programs, Maya Angelou and Central High School, who uh, some of them greeted the president uh, of France as he landed at Andrews Air Force Base and others uh, who, were, who participated in a uh, program uh, receiving him at the White House, and I just want to acknowledge uh, our students and the opportunities uh, that, that they have here. I'd like to recognize, uh, you, you saw the Howard B. Owen Science Center uh, news break. Uh, the principal of Howard B. Owens, I think is still here, Chiquita Way, Ray. Uh, thank you uh, so much for all that you do. Uh, it is a wonderful place. I have enjoyed my visits there, and I appreciate all that you and your uh, faculty and staff do to serve our children. Um, as uh, Dr. Eubanks uh, noted, we are indeed celebrating uh, some very important people this, this week, our teachers uh, uh, and our school nurses. Tuesday was National Teacher Appreciation Day, and Wednesday was National School Nurse Day. Many of our schools are celebrating our hardworking educators all week long with many of these efforts spearheaded by school leadership teams and parent organizations. Uh, and I would just like to join Dr. Eubanks in congratulating our teachers and our nurses and our other faculty and staff for all that they do for us each and every day. Uh, on Monday, uh, this coming Monday, Prince George's County will announce our 2018 Teacher of the Year at our dinner gala. Uh, we want to thank uh, our 2017 uh, Teacher of the Year, Carolyn Marski from uh, Ridgecrest Elementary School for being our ambassador for great teaching and great public schools over this past year. In addition, uh, a number of Prince George's County Public Schools faculty and staff members have been honored by statewide professional organizations and associations for their achievements this year. Uh, Dominique Malardi at Charles H. Flowers High School was named the Maryland Pro Start Culinary Arts Teacher of the Year for Maryland. We congratulate him. Irene Prescott at Kenmore Middle School was named Maryland History Day Teacher of the Year. And Julie Grossman was named the Maryland School Psychologist of the Year. This is the third consecutive year that Prince George's County Public Schools has received, has, a, has had a school psychologist receive this award. And I might just personally acknowledge that Julie was a student of mine when I was principal at Walter Johnson High School. Uh, so congratulations to uh, those employees of ours who won statewide recognition. I also want to take a moment, if I might, I don't know if we have a photographer here or not, but I know Wes has his cell phone. Um, I want to take a moment to recognize our outstanding staff in the Accounting and Financial Reporting Office. Prince George's County Public Schools was awarded the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting by the Government Finance Officers Association of the United States and Canada. This Certificate of Achievement is the highest form of recognition in the area of governmental accounting and financial reporting. And at this time, if they are here, I'd like uh, Ms. Peggy Harrison, CPA, Assistant Controller, Ms. Pamela Hay, Assistant Controller, and the entire Accounting and Reporting Office staff to stand and be recognized for this great accomplishment. And I do have a certificate for them so they could actually come down front and we could take a picture with the board uh, for and, and I'll give them a round of uh, applause after we do the presentation. So congratulations to those, to our outstanding colleagues. Can you come down and...
And, uh, and finally, uh, well wishes are also in order for two-star STEM students who are headed to the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair next week. This is the world's largest science fair. Congratulations to Teresa Osga at Eleanor Roosevelt High School and Jada Collins at Oxon Hill High School. Mr. Chair, members of the board, this concludes my remarks. Thank you very much, Dr. Maxwell. I will now yield the floor to the chairman of the Finance Audit and Budget Committee, Ms. Carolyn Boston, for a committee report. Good evening. Is it morning? It's afternoon. Oh. Good afternoon. <laughs> The 2017-2018 Finance Audit and Budget uh, Committee members include Ms. Sonia Williams, Vice Chair, Dr. Sagoon Eubanks, Ms. Denor Hernandez, Mr. K. Alexander Wallace, Ms. Amanya Page, Mr. John Fister, Chief Finance Officer, and Mrs. Michelle Winston, Director of Internal Audit. The FAB Committee has convened eight times the school year to discuss an array of topics to include review of fiscal year 2019 budget, breaking, bearing, I'm sorry, in mind feedback and discussion from the board budget work sessions and public hearings, review second quarter report from internal auditor, review and discuss impact of county executives budget proposal. Some of our accomplishments thus far have been the board included supportive funding to all of the identified board budget priorities, maintenance funding, student-based budgeting, English language learner support, compensation negotiated agreements, and pre-kindergarten expansion. Upon return from the county council, if additional funds are allotted, the committee further proposed funding in the following areas, community schools, literacy and numeracy, career and technology education, and student safety. Future topics for discussion include review and discuss impact of county council approved budget, review third quarter internal audit report, review anticipated Prince George's County Public Schools financial condition for year end June 30th, 2018. Additional future events, the board will put the fiscal year 2019 budget to a final vote during the June 21st board meeting. In closing, I would like to thank the FAB committee members, the CEO, the Chief Financial Officer, and the administration for their efforts in ensuring this budget season is a collaborative, thought-provoking, and strategic process that move us closer to excellence. Thank you. Thank you so much for that report, Ms. Boston. Colleagues, we now move on to our public comment uh, on agenda and non-agenda items. We have 15 registered speakers today speaking on non-agenda items. I remind my friends and colleagues that you have been registered to speak in public comment, uh, where the Board of Education will listen to your comments uh, but will not address your comments. All registered, registered speakers have three minutes to make their presentation at the sound of the buzzer please complete your final sentence only, uh, and please do not relinquish any part of your speaking time to another individual. Um, please do not address individuals um, uh, directly by name or using profanity or derogatory terms, uh, and adherence to these uh, simple procedures will help us with a smooth and orderly process and make sure that everyone's voice is heard. Um, so again, we have only non-registered speakers today. My first, I mean, I'm sorry, speakers on non-agenda items. Uh, my first registered speaker is Anthony Brent, sixth grade student at CMIT South. Good afternoon, CEO, board members, parents, and staff members of PGCPS. My name is Anthony Britt, and I am a scholar at CMIT South. Today, I stand in support of my teachers and my mom, who was a teacher in Prince George's County Public Schools. I would like the CEO to understand through the eyes of a child whose parent is a teacher in our county why they should receive a raise. Year in and year, I watched my mother head off to work the first day of school to greet her new students. I watched her prepare for back-to-school night giving parents 
clear expectations. See, I watch her Monday through Friday, go to work, come home, and check my homework, head off to practice with me, patiently sit and wait all while grading papers, preparing lessons for the next day. Making phone calls to parents, sending and checking emails, attending games for me and her students, preparing dinner all before going to bed. I watch on the weekends how she spends time with the family, doing house chores, preparing and cooking Sunday dinner, dinner, helping with projects, checking my sister's college papers, and working 16 hours part-time. I see, live, and respect all the hard work and effort my mom put in each work to ensure students are college and career ready. I know so many other teachers in PGCPS who lifestyle matches my mom's. The teachers work hard every day with no increased payment for their free, free, fruitful labor. I like so many other students who are repeating we need to be college and career ready, not really understanding it. So I went and had a talk with my sister to get a real understanding of college and career ready. She had me predict what I thought of, what I thought it meant. Then she had me read PDCPS mission and vision statement. She had me analyze and make annotations throughout my reading. She had me use the reading strategy that I was taught to do daily in my classes by teachers in PDCPS. See, I made real connections. I was peer taught and I had accountability talk and in a conversation while I read. These are things that we're taught to by taught me by hardworking teachers in PDCPS. My sister is definitely a scholar. She is at the Acad Academy of Health and Science at PDCPS with a GPA of 4.8. And by the way, all the kids at her school should be recognized because the ha they have 100% graduation rate and 100% college acceptance since the school opened. Other schools from other states is coming to see what they do and how they can model them. A good example of the work that the teachers put in to make PDCPS great by choice that being said, to the CEO, I want you to do what you expect me to do as a scholar in PGCPS. I expect you to award the hard work of our teachers because you expect them to award me with a quality education. Thank you, Mr. Brent, for that outstanding presentation. Our next speaker is Kim Brent. Good afternoon, CEO, board members, parents, and staff members of PGCPS. My name is Kim Brent, and I am the proud mother of that gentleman who spoke before me and a professional educator in Prince George's County Public Schools. Today, I stand firm, tall, and proud before you asking the board and the CEO to reconsider and give teachers a pay raise. There's a lot of talk about the secret 12% or higher pay raises given to central office and why they should not receive the raises. I do not doubt that any person in the educational field should receive raises. The reason that was given by our CEO why, they, why the central office received pay raises was they were given more responsibilities. Well, so have I and all the teachers in PGCPS. As a teacher, I would like to give the board members and the CEO who voted no to the 4% pay raise for teachers reasons why, and it is grounded in evidence every day with every teacher. When I stand outside my classroom in the morning on duty, watching the students come in, walking safely down the hall, I am no longer a teacher. I've been given the responsibility of being a hall monitor. While my students are eating breakfast in my pre-K classroom, I must ensure they do not choke and they are eating things that they are not allergic to. I have now become the school nurse. When my students come in disheveled and hair and clothes are not in place, I am no longer the teacher. I become the mom and their hairstylist. When my struggling students are struggling and want to give up, I am no longer the teacher. I become their cheerleader, their motivator, their physical, their physical inner voice telling them they can. When they are having self-esteem issues, home issues, or just need to smile or laugh that day, I am no longer the teacher. I become their understanding teacher their therapeutic soundboard, their comedian. When they need an example of what it looks like to make little money, but you do it because you love it, I am their real world connection. When they need a living example of a person standing up for what they believe in, I am no longer their teacher. I am not the person that I teach them about. I am their Martin Luther King. I am their Malcolm X. I am their Rosa Parks. 
all while closing the achievement gaps and following the mission, the vision, and the core values of BGCPS, ensuring that they are college and career ready by 2020. The board members and CEO who voted no to not give the teachers the 4% raise, where are, your, where are your examples that are grounded in evidence that teachers should not get a raise? I ask the board and the CEO to humbly vote again before June 1st and ask that you vote yes to one, giving teachers a 4% raise, effective July 1st, two, giving teachers a, giving teachers a 2% cost of living increase every year. The federal government does it, why can't we? And three, that the board members be required to visit every school in their district and have a town hall meeting with teachers at least twice during the school year. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm the last sentence. I ask that you remember Second Timothy, the hardworking farmers should be the first to enjoy the fruit of his labors. Teacher, teachers in PGCPS are Thank the you. hardworking farmers. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mercy or Mercy McKinley. Is Ms. McKinley here? Ms. McKinley. Ms. McKinley, okay. Our next registered speaker is Paul Shackelford, uh, Executive Director of Turning Point Academy. Hey. Are you Aisha? <laughs> awesome. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Paul Shackelford. Good afternoon. I'm the founder and exec, one of the founders and the executive director of Turning Point Academy. My wife and I just celebrated our 35th wedding anniversary, and so, yeah, that's, that's big stuff. Uh, and so, I'm kind of pumped up about that. We cut our time together short so that we could come back here for this meeting, but I see we're not even on the agenda. But at any rate, I should acknowledge our Chairman of the board, Vincent Queen. He's in the back. He's standing up with his cane. He just had knee surgery. Uh, I think we've got Terry Fleuro, board member. My wife is the founder. The other folks couldn't make it today. But at any rate, uh, students come first to us. Emotional intelligence. Okay, the art of being able to understand and the ebb and flow of interactions takes a lot of hard work. All of you board members do this on a regular basis, and I acknowledge and fully understand the amount of work that goes into listening to everyone, sorting through all the details, reading documents, and then discussing options, participating in community events, and every day just listening to concerns. I know it's overwhelming. I know that. And at times, it's probably exhausting. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. A lot of folks don't say thank you, but I get it. Students should come first. Our founders, our board members, and I still believe that busing should be provided for our students regardless of the county administration team, stating that the busing money should have been better used to purchase a building. We've provided busing all 11 years that we've been open, and we believe that it should continue. Our student population is around 70% farms, and so busing is mandatory for those folks. So, uh, Dr. Crawley and I drove to six schools together, and we, we agreed together that John Carroll would be a perfect fit for Turning Point Academy. Most recently, uh, we had a, an offer put into Craftsman Circle in Chevrolet Tuxedo to purchase it, but we were outbid. That building was $9 million, and I, we, we put in an offer for six. It was only worth six. The people got it for $9 million. It just doesn't make sense to buy a building for $9 million when you can buy it for six. That's a waste of money. So we also had an opportunity to move into Berkshire. Berkshire. Our teachers said no. It's too dangerous there. We can't move there. We don't want to move there. So, okay. We also had an opportunity to purchase the Washington Bible College. Now, I'll finish by saying that a developer came in 
with Chinese backing, and they bought that property for $11 million and turned around and, and sold it to another Chinese group the re next year for $17 million. We, we can't, I mean, you can't fight big business like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Thank you, so, Mr. Shackle. So, so, so as I wrap up, okay. if I may, because you... Thank you, sir. All right. <laughs> so what I want to say is we want to give back to the children. We've been doing this for 11 years. We made a couple mistakes, but our heart is to the children. They come first. Thank you. Great and, way and to lastly, end. Great I way want to, to say, end. Great way to end. If I, if I may, may say <laughs> yeah, one my, last thing. I'm afraid you're going to do your take, we take believe time that from the next teachers, speaker, do you? We believe that the teachers need a raise, okay. and we also right. believe that the Board Thank of you. Education office should get a raise, Thank too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Deborah Shackelford, founder of Turning Point Academy. Hello, uh, I am Deborah Shackelford, one of the founders of Turning Point Academy. I want to acknowledge another founder that's here, Michael Peterson. Um, thank you, Chairman, for being here. Um, he is recuperating, but he wanted to make sure he was here today. He, he did just have knee surgery, but he wanted to be here. Um, Prince George's County's vision, the school system's highest priority is to prepare students to meet the demands of college of, of college and careers. That is also our vision. Um, it is our goal at Turning Point Academy to reach the underserved. We have 70% farms. Uh, our board consists of lawyers, accountants, parents, teachers, loan officers, chemical engineer, and, uh, and they're all volunteers. They come to the board meetings, they attend um, the go sees for some of the buildings that we, we look at, um, and, and each year, our board attends board governance training that's approved by a Maryland, from a Maryland firm three times a year. We value our board and our school staff. We hire exceptional staff, and we let them do their job. We hired the current principal, Ms. Clomax. We, know that we knew that she would be an effective leader and would be loved and respected by her staff. The teachers give her their best. A person who feels appreciated will always do more than what is expected, and she makes them feel valued. A number of our staff were either let go because of their job title, no longer been in existence in the county, or they were given to other schools. We fought to get them back. Our principal, Ms. Clomax, was transferred. We fought to get her back. Our um, a character education person was, her job title was eliminated three times. We fought to get her back. We have a very cohesive um, group and they work so well together. Even our cafeteria manager was taken to another school and we fought to get her back. Last March, the Charter Review Board came, and to, came into the school teachers meeting and told them of their intent to close the school and of course that threatened what they felt was their cohesive unit and uh, they would no longer be able to give their best to the school that they put so much time into. So I understand their anger, I understand they have to put that somewhere. Um, Maryland board takeovers have only been because of low grades, poor facilities, low attendance in the school, or mismanagement of funds. None of that has been TPA's problem. TPA uh, serves 70% farms, outperforms the county and state in the eighth grade. We provide busing for our students getting picked up from as far as Clinton to come to our school. Each of our bus drivers have 27 stops. Will Prince George's County do that for them as well? I ask, please continue the excellence. Please continue to let our board and our teachers and staff and executive director to continue the excellence in the county. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, who's I will uh, forgive me in advance for the pronunciation, but Obayemi Ajikaye to speak about uh, TPA Academy. Good afternoon, the board members and every uh, person present here today. Uh, my name is Okoyemi Ajakai. I'm one of the parents at Tony Point Academy. 
Uh, Tony Point Academy is one of the prestigious 12 public charter schools in the Prince George's County. And this school has been performing as an institution that, pro uh, that does many good things for various stakeholders. I know as uh, the district school district administration, most of the concern would be in terms of the dollar amount that is spent on each enrolled student and judge student performance uh, based on their report. Teachers also, as a stakeholder in school, probably want to be you know, treated as a valued employees. Students will place more value on familiarities and stability and comfort in their school surroundings, along with ongoing connections to classmates and teachers, including their staff. Parents, most especially, we want to uh, you know, have good educational results for our children in a stable, safe school setting and also tend to value ongoing relationship with our teacher and staff. There are so many good stuff about Stony Point Academy. Uh, the PGCPS uh, website records that PG, uh, Stony Point Academy school performance is above many of the county schools. Most recently, 32 of the Stony Point Academy students just got inducted into the National Junior Honor Society, having demonstrated excellence in area of scholarship achievements with GPA of 3.0 to 4.2 and above. Bus services provide parents, most especially, uh, you know, the comfort that we have our kids in a safe environment, both to and from school. Supports provided to students by both teaching and not teaching staff, they are above equal. And uh, personally, my kids, they do not feel as a backseaters when they meet with kids of other schools, including tag school. So effect of closing turning point will cause disruption to student stability over a long period of time. The common relationship between students and their peers, including their teachers, will be broken. Adapting to new school, friends, teachers, including the routes to the school, may become a burden for the students and even we parents. Many of, we, I mean, of us parents, we have AM and PM routine already planned. But if we change our schedule, then that may result to higher out-of-pocket costs for us to plan such care for our kids. The feeling of being devalued to our teachers at Tony Point Academy should not be a payback from the county and the board as they work hard every day. I hereby suggest to this board today that please continue to work with the current board and keep Tony Point Academy open. In one of the open letters that the board sent to all the parents and the community on May 2nd, you did state there that you're going to listen to the cry of the parents, and I think this is the time to listen to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Teresa Dudley, president of Prince George's County Educators Association. Good afternoon, everyone. And happy Teacher Appreciation Day to all the members of PGCA that are watching. All the members of PGCA are in the audience today. Would you please stand up so you can be recognized for Teacher Appreciation Day, please? I want to thank you for coming out today. Our teachers work really hard. And I've been receiving a lot of correspondence from my members concerned about why they don't feel appreciated by the system. And I believe my thoughts and my sentiments were along the same lines last year. I received questions about what exactly is a transition because in everything that we've seen about the CEO's contract, there's nothing in there about a transition. And we're just wondering why would we allow for someone to leave on, um, good graces when we've had secret pay raises, members put on administrative leave for following um, directions that were given to them from the central office. And most of all, if this is a resignation, it should have been done within 90 days, not 61 days. We, we're we just concerned about how we're being treated and it's almost a double standard because if one of us did anything we're placed on administrative leave, and in some cases our emails cut off, and it's just not fair. And do I think everything Dr. Maxwell has done, excuse me, the CEO has done is reprehensible? No. Have I ever called for his resignation or for him to be fired? No. 
because I don't believe the problem is Dr. Maxwell. I believe the problem is inherent in the structure of our system that allows for there not to be a voice from the people. And what we need to do as we move forward, and we're asking, we're demanding, we're begging, we're pleading that whatever movement forward includes the community stakeholders in this process because the people of Prince George's County have been shut out and shut down and the voices are not being heard. The minority voices on this board are not being heard. And that's why they run to the media all the time because they're not being heard. When we wanted to hear about District Heights Elementary School, we were shut down and we didn't have that conversation. It was done in that back room where I believe a lot of things that are going on in executive session should be done out here in the public and that way people can hear and feel and know what's really going on. So we ask you for that and we urge you to honor our request with that when it comes to selecting new leadership at PGCPS in the days ahead, teachers, parents, bus drivers, staff workers, custodians, the Chamber of Commerce that we all receive a are given a seat at the table. Thank you for your attention to this important matter and I look forward to hearing your response. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dudley. Our next speaker is Felicia Hubb. Is Ms. Hubb here? Felicia Hubb. Is this Ms. Hub right here? No, okay, no. Um, okay, our next speaker is Phyllis Wright. Good evening. Is my mic on this time? Because the last time I was here, it wasn't on. So, um, is my mic on? I'm asking you, sir. Sure, certainly sounds Okay, like my mic is on. The reason why I'm here because he just walked out and he did the right thing. He should have been gone. A million dollars need to go to our children, our classrooms, and our teachers, not to him. A service package, we don't need that. We all know that the buildings are crumbling. You all know what he's doing and what he's not doing. Please, please, you all are his friends. Do not give him that million dollars. That's public fund money. It's not you all's money. You have all been doing what you want with that money, but everything that goes in the dark will come to the light. So going forward saying this, it's election year, and I hope and pray that the right people get in and that this board, some of you all, will be gone because you're not doing the right thing by these children. You took these jobs to, to take care of our kids in Prince George's County, and what did all of the neglect that you all have done to our kids and our teachers? We can't keep teachers because you all giving yourself raises and not paying these teachers. And I don't understand why Mr. Over Here is sitting here when he can chase a child off a school bus and still sit here and get six figures. I don't understand that. I don't understand y'all rules and regulations and those backdoor sessions that you all make. Maxwell walked out, he should have been gone. He, he, he's resigning, why is he still here? Why is he still here? So when you leave, you leave with nothing because we didn't fire him, he left on his own. So you cutting me off again? You probably tell them to cut my mic off because the last time I was here, that's what you all did. I'm not gonna disrespect nobody. But I'm going to say what I feel. He needs to be gone there. Transition what? Transition out of here. That's what you transit. Transition out of here. You don't want to pay the teachers. And I was with my board member last night because I performed at the school because I participate with my children in their schools. I'm a parent that participates. I'm going to be in every school that they go into. And I ask you all to come out and be at those schools as well. You understand? But see, no, 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 no. Don't, no, don't shake. Don't shake. But tell him to keep on walking because that's what he needs to do. We gave him his walking papers. And the best thing he did is when he resigned. Now, he don't need to wait until the 26th to leave. He needs to go now. Transition what? And he shouldn't take a million dollars. That million dollars need to go back. Oh, and by the way, that $450,000 we gave him for a signing bonus, I want that back too because that's my tax dollar. That's my tax dollar and I want it back. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm not going to get upset. And, and I don't understand why this man is sitting up here chasing a child off a of school bus. See, y'all have rules for different people. I ain't calling okay, no but, names. Okay, but you're calling no names. I ain't calling no names. Okay. Now, 
right, you thank know you. who I'm talking to. Move. Don't tell me that. Thing. Thank you, Miss Wright. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Appreciate you. Our next, our next speaker is Esther Page. About Turning Point Academy. Good afternoon. I'm a parent of a current third grader of TPA. My daughter has been attending TPA since kindergarten and placing her in the hands of the staff of TPA has been the best decision I've made. Let me explain why. I went to visit my neighborhood elementary school when she was still in pre-K. I'm sorry, when she was still in daycare to see what school I wanted to put her in and I was very disappointed with the lack of organization. I felt like I was in a movie where the walls were closing in on me very loud and very fast. I could only imagine if I felt this way, how would my five-year-old feel? I was not happy to say the least. Once I stepped foot into Turning Point Academy, I was immediately greeted with a good morning, not only by Ms. Brown, who sits at the front desk, but I was also greeted by Mr. Paul Shackelford, the executive director and other staff, who people claim he is not present. Fast forwarding to my daughter's first year of kindergarten, I remember having an issue with her teacher and I sent an email to the school informing the principal and the teacher of the issue. Not only did I get a response back from both parties, I also received a follow-up phone call not a letter, but a phone call from Mr. Paul Shackelford, the executive director, who people still claim is not present. I was very impressed by the way the situation was handled in the moment and afterwards. I love that about TPA. The faculty and staff remind me of my elementary school teachers. They handle everything with love, grace, and integrity, which is part of what they instill in our children, character education. When my daughter came home using words that a second grader would be using and doing things that an older child would normally do, I could do nothing but smile. When I would ask her where she learned that new word from or learned that, um, that phrase, telling the truth is pertinent to life and builds character. I was taken aback, but she boldly, proudly, and proudly said, from school, that's what we're learning right now. Oh, and yes, she did use the word pertinent in kindergarten. Moving on, I gave birth last July to this nine month old right here, and I had no choice to have, but to have a C-section. I was not cleared to drive until mid-October. My husband was working, my mother, my father, my siblings, everyone in my family was working. No one was able to take my child to school for me, but, who, but you know who was? Turning Point. They provided free busing for my daughter. I was on bed rest for three months, and if it hadn't have been for free busing from TPA, my daughter probably would have missed or have been extremely late to school every day for the first two months of school. I have heard talk about the building not being good enough and in good enough condition for the children to learn in. That's just plain BS, excuse my language. But how many schools in PG have had or still currently have a rodent problem, sewage problem, where bathrooms do not properly function, or how about water fountains shooting out brown water or even AC or heat not working properly? These are just things that happened while I was attending school. So if you're gonna close a school based on the building, why don't you help us find a building instead of closing our building? In closing, I just wanna also point out that if PG is going to take over and the current staff in places under your leadership, then I know the dynamic will change. The culture of the school will change. Please keep all staff, faculty, and board members in its place and another person who is just as important as the teachers, our executive director. If you change them, I would rather homeschool my child than move her to another school and put her under new leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Nadine Sales Selman. Good after board chair and members. My name is Nadine Sales Selman. In the interest of being an advocate for change at Turning Point Academy, I am here to express the desires of administration, faculty, and staff to one, extend the TPA charter agreement for only one year instead of five. Two, replace the majority of TPA's board and have an inclusive process, process for board member selection that includes at least one TPA teacher. Three, work with the school district and stakeholders to identify a current PGCPS building for rent or another appropriate space. We have 602 students of which nearly half of whom are currently in dilapidated trailers. Caved in floors, exposed support beams, and holes under the trailers have allowed large vermin to come in and set up breeding dens. According to Paul Shackelford, $40,000 a month with all utilities included justifies us having no protection from potential armed gunmen and unfingerprinted strangers roaming the building for funerals and church events during school hours. 
Last year, a man was found sleeping in the Reed 180 classroom inside the building. After being chased down and caught by staff, he stated, Pastor Tino said, I'm allowed to sleep in here. Every Thursday and Monday morning, teachers housed inside the building must come in and do quick fixes to their damaged classrooms. In the 11 years that we have been open, our executive director, Paul Shackelford, who was a realtor, has been unable to procure a facility that meets PGCPS compliance standards. All the while, every other charter school that opened after us has multiple campuses. I have also witnessed the lack of know-how and motivation to correct the issues previously identified by the charter board. On April 9, 2018, Mr. Shackelford and Ms. Peterson stated that they were not sure what needed to be in a strategic plan. Their plan was to reach out to the charter board and request a rubric. Mr. Shackelford further showed his incompetence by requesting CMIT's strategic plan from Executive Director Mr. Lancaster with the intent to copy and paste it in order to create TPAs. I sent you the email. This is in direct violation of his job description, which is to provide valuable strategic planning. We have no faith that he or the ghost members of the current board have the ability to bring TPA into compliance with the policies and regulations of PGCPS. An executive director's job description requires a master's degree from an accredited institution with a focus in education. Mr. Shackelford does not possess such a degree per his resume, which I also forwarded. As of the 2017-18 school year, only two meetings were recorded due to lack of attendance by board members, April 3rd and October 9th. At our last site visit, not one board member was present to speak with the Charter Review Board. Mr. Shackelford, as executive director, should represent TPA at school events. Yet he has not attended any fundraising events, honor roll assemblies, or our first ever National Junior Honor Society induction ceremony. We do not have faith that Mr. Shackelford will miraculously morph into the executive director that our school so desperately needs. We ask that you support our recommendations that the mission and vision of TPA can truly be realized. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rhea Mallory. Mallory, I'm sorry. Hello, my name is Rhea Mallory. In April 2017, I was con contacted by the Executive Director representing the Turning Point Academy to assure grant funding for building acquisition and curriculum development. Before I moved to DC, I was a college counselor for charter schools in Detroit for over 14 years and developed a college-going culture that garnered $2.4 million in scholarships for the graduating class of 61 students. More recently, I'm a certified federal grant administrator and I hold a Juris Doctor specializing in special education, law, policy, and access to educational programs for students in need. Upon listening to the TPA board, I walked away with impressions that I wanna share with you today. If you will, think about a ship on a mission across seas. There are many people who are pivotal in ensuring everything goes as planned. There are seamen, sailors, crew, etc. And guess whose job it is to conceive the mission and steer the ship in the right direction, making ongoing altercations to the route when wa waters are rough and to avoid storms, all while keeping the mission at the for forefront. It's the captain. The captain is likely the person who conceived or even, shall I say in this context, chartered the mission in the first place. Well, the executive director and the entire board has been, for the last 11 years, captains of the Turning Point Academy. Reaching academic excellence takes competence for everyone on the ship. This team effort has guided TPA to outperform the county and the state, which I can imagine was no small feat. When I first met Mr. Shackelford, I heard his vision for the school and his passion for his students, and I welcomed the opportunity to help any way I could. The vision of bringing charter education to our young population is much needed, and there is grant money for such an endeavor. I attended the first board meeting here concerning keeping TPA closed, and I listened to the parents and students of TPA and was touched by their testimonies and how important the school is to them. I thought to myself, well, why isn't the county asking the board to replicate these results throughout the county by adding more TPA academies instead of putting it on the chopping block? It's clearly reaching an underserved demographic and doing quite well. 
In my 14 years of education, I contributed to budget meetings for charter schools that didn't make annual yearly progress. As you may know, those are hard conversations to have. But the fact that this board could have done a number of things with the money used for buses, uh, uh, but opted to steer a TPA ship in the right direction is commendable. So I always urge you to do three things. One, ask yourselves who or what is pushing for a ship that is headed in the right direction to be derailed. Two, keep Turning Point Academy open by reinstituting their, re instituting their charter. And lastly, enable this sitting TPA board and an executive director to guide the ship continue toward academic excellence for years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Felicia Motley. Is Felicia Motley not here? Okay, thank you. Uh, our final registered speaker is Gina Bowler, uh, Overlook Spanish Immersion School PTA. Good afternoon. My name is Gina Bowler. I'm, I live in District 9, Upper Marlboro. I'm the proud parent of a first grader and a third grader at Overlook Spanish Immersion School in Temple Hills, District 7. Um, before we even had a Spanish immersion program, before the configuration, the composition of our current school leadership, I was advocating uh, for Spanish immersion along with others. And I want to thank Dr. Maxwell and this board for bringing the Spanish Immersion Program to us. No small feat given that um, the, Sp the French Immersion Program, which has been very successful, uh, has been around for over 30 years. So I really want to acknowledge that accomplishment. Thank you for, for doing that for our school and our um, children, our community. Today I'm speaking as co-chair of the Advocacy and Legislative Committee at Overlook, um, the PTA. Uh, my daughters and I have been with Overlook since the Spanish Immersion Program started in the 2014-2015 school year. It got off to a great start and it continues to improve. I'll mention just a few milestones this year. We became a dedicated Spanish immersion school with our third grade uh, students. Um, the comprehensive students graduated last year. We got a new principal who is uh, English, um, Spanish bilingual. Our PTA continues to grow and mature. Um, the parents of our kindergarten class um, Re, um, basically reinstated the PTA after it had been defunct for some years. We even won an award from the Maryland PTA for our increase in membership that first year. Uh, we have been funding many events at the school. Um, for instance, we just funded um, IXL, which I didn't even know what it was, but it's some sort of online math sort of preparation for PARC. We're very excited about that. And um, we're also expanding and deepening our roots in the school community. We did a coin drive for the neighboring apartment building. Um, residents were victims of a fire. And we also are just beginning um, a new business partnership program that we're very excited about. The arts integration uh, program came to our school this year. Students, parents, um, teachers helped paint amazing murals inside and outside of the building. I encourage everyone to come see the building, at least drive by and see it um, at the front of the building. Uh, so we definitely have the look and feel of a Spanish immersion school. Uh, we also had our first science fair in Spanish our first Spanish spelling bee book fair and character parade. Uh, we're going to offer Spanish summer camp this year after it was offered at Capitol Heights Elementary School. So we're very excited about that. And um, we're excited about the Language Immersion Task Force. We're looking forward to expansion of all of the language immersion programs um, here in our county. I'm running out of time, um, but thank you again uh, for supporting our students in providing an excellent education, multilingual, and multicultural skills. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Bola, and thank you to all of our citizens who come out um, and speak to us at each meeting. That concludes our public comment session for this evening, and we will move, move on to item 4.0. Uh, and a discussion item, and I'll yield the floor to Dr. Maxwell and his administration for their presentation and to lead a discussion on item 4.1, enrollment and facility utilization. Dr. Maxwell. Thank you, Dr. Eubanks, members of the board. Uh, 
Dr. Wesley Watts is going to introduce our staff that will provide an overview of enrollment and facility utilization. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Today we will give a brief presentation uh, from the Department of Capital Programs from uh, Dr. Director Sean Matlock and his team on enrollment and facility utilization. Sean. Uh, good morning. Um, good afternoon, board. Uh, uh, we have uh, Rihanna, uh, um, uh, uh, Rihanna McCarter, uh, and um, Ron Kaufman. I'm sorry, Ron, Ron Kaufman and uh, Beth Chasen. who are going to give a presentation on our enrollment and facility utilization. Good afternoon. Chairman Eubanks, uh, Vice Chair Boston, members of the Board of Education, Dr. Maxwell, leadership, and most welcome guests. Good afternoon. My name is Ron Kaufman. I'm a facility planning consultant representing Department of Capital Programs. I, I also have here today with me uh, Mrs. Elizabeth Chason, the CIB officer, Ms. Rihanna McCarter, who's a planning and school boundary specialist. And Mr. Sean Matlock is a director of capital programs. I will be presenting today with Ms. McCarter and Mr. Matlock regarding the enrollment facility utilization. We'll discuss some challenges um, and potential solutions. Current and proposed new CIP delivery methods we'll also touch upon today. And we just ask you to hold your questions to the end of our presentation. Uh, most of them will be answered, and if we don't, we have questions at the end, we'll be glad to entertain them. I'll turn, um, just to give you an overview of this presentation today, um, we're going to provide you with historical enrollment trends and projections. We're going to share some challenges with you regarding the facility utilization. We're going to provide you an overall picture of the schools uh, with seat availability. We'll share some potential solutions that were used successfully in the past by Prince George's County Public Schools and other school systems throughout the country. And finally, we'll allow time for your questions. And I'm going to turn this over to Ms. McCarter to present the historic and enrollment projections. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Um, on the slide before you, um, on the chart on the left, we're, we're sharing the historic and projected enrollment in Prince George's County Public Schools for grades K to 12. Um, we'll note that beginning in school year 2013, we see a system-wide uh, upward trend in enrollment. And since then, we've increased by 9,000 students. Uh, looking to the future years, um, we are projecting an additional increase of 8,000 students over the next seven years. While system-wide we're growing, the geographic distribution of the growth has been uneven. Uh, the map on the right displays seat availability. Uh, facilities with a deficit of seats are shown in red and are concentrated above Central Avenue inside the Beltway. Facilities with uh, with seats available are shown in green and are mainly concentrated in the lower half of the county. Um, breaking out enrollment just in elementary grades, we see an increase of 8,500 students since 2010 as larger kindergarten cohorts began to enter the school system each year. Over the next seven years, we expect enrollment in these grades to remain relatively stable uh, near current levels. Looking at middle school grades, we've increased by 3,000 students since 2013, and looking forward, we expect an increase of an additional 2,500 students within three years, again, as those larger cohorts move from ele the elementary schools into the middle schools, which they've already begun to do. At the high school level, uh, we actually experienced a decline of 5,000 students during the early part of this decade. Um, however, enrollment is a trending upward, and we expect an increase of 6,000 students over the next seven years. Uh, 
challenges uh, as a result of the enrollment shifts that were just described by Ms. McCarter, the majority of our schools are either over or under enrolled. We're currently experiencing overutilization inside the Beltway above Central Avenue. And some of the challenges of that are increased classroom sizes, uh, higher teacher-student ratios, overcrowded course spaces, cafeterias, auditorium, and media center, reduced parking and vehicular uh, circulation, bus parking and bus pickup areas are overcrowded. And conver conversely, uh, underutilization below Central Avenue, uh, some of those challenges, we have many facilities with uh, many vacant classrooms, not enough students to support full-time specialty teachers such as art and music, there's a higher cost per student to operate these facilities and energy administration and staff. And the utilization prevents state from participating in funding of major replacement and new school projects. Just an overview of some solutions that are out there to mitigate um, over and under utilization. There's three major categories of solutions used successfully. Uh, operation and programmatic, capital improvement program to build and, and add new schools, of course, which is a long term, and the balance and enrollment. We will review each item in detail in the next few slides just to give you an idea of what each of these are. Portable classrooms, the most common um, way to provide temporary capacity relief. Um, it allows faster setup and installation compared to permanent construction. The majority of the growth that occurred over the last seven years have been relieved by using portable classrooms. And currently many of the sites do not have any more space to have any portable classrooms where we need it. Uh, currently we have 542 units in inventory, uh, 465 units are actively used at 88 school sites. 40% of those units are over 25 years old and they're beyond uh, the standard life cycle of those units. Uh, just to give you an idea, to replace one of them brand new, installed is about 95,000 for a classroom, single classroom. Operational and programmatic solutions. Um, these are some uh, operational includes changes, this uses the facility for more hours of the day. When you talk about operational, it's, it's changing the schedule of, of the, the uh, school day. You have split and staggered start times, which is a 50% earlier start for half of the population of the school. And basically you're just overlapping the other 50% to utilize your uh, classrooms better and your course spaces really take the um, it's, it's a scheduling um, um, solution there. Uh, morning and afternoon shift, which is really bringing uh, half the population in in the morning and ending in the middle of the day and having another uh, half the population in the afternoon. So you're using the facility more hours of the day and you could double the capacity in certain schools doing that. And multi-tracking is a year-round school, which um, you have school going on all year long, and 25% of the population is off on a break. So you actually can increase the capacity by 25%. And then you have innovative type programmatic um, solutions, which are non-traditional hours that you would set up different programs to be on-site or off-site. Virtual, online is one of those examples. Dual enrollment. Um, college campus, you can bring that on, or a business site. An evening CTE program can, can do that as well. This is just to give you a look at what we have in our current CIP for um, construction of either new or replacement schools. This, shot, uh, this slide shows a list of priorities that we have for the FY19. The asterisk shows uh, those projects that will add capacity. And we have the, the new International High School at Langley Park. That's in design, William Wirt replacement. That's also in design. 
And what that means is that we've hired architects uh, for those schools, um, and we hired all of those schools with the exception of the new elementary Adelphi area school and the northern area high school. Uh, and based on the historical capital funding stream that we've been experiencing, the amount of funds required, just to give you an example, um, it, it could probably take four to five years to do the two schools that are in design and maybe one middle school. Um, and Mr. Matlock will describe the new project delivery method that will allow the completion of more facilities in a shorter amount of time utilizing alternative financing, which that's one of the ideas. Um, one of the things that we're, we're looking to do is to develop a P3. Uh, some of the board members, uh, Ms. Williams being one of them, uh, was very instrumental in helping us start to put together the framework for what uh, a P3 might look like uh, and, and understanding the balance that needs to happen within uh, the county, both in the north and in the south, because it's stated we have underutilization, which makes it impossible for us to get state matching funding for some of the schools there. So you need creative ways to fund that type of educational environment to, to put money into that. So what we are trying to do, and we've been in close consultation with both the county council and also with the county executive's office, um, we're trying to work through numbers now, but we're looking something like a $25 million uh, ask over that would be a stream of, of income that would be used for what's called a, um, uh, a availability payment. And that availability payment would go to a private partner who would construct and maintain the buildings that we would build under this private partnership. So they would do the life cycle maintenance. They would make sure that we have a roof, uh, make sure that the HVA system works all the time, um, not just after they built it, uh, uh, that it would be maintained properly, that there would be constant maintenance on it, uh, that the, the areas, all the piping and all the works that make a building work would continue to work, and they would provide the maintenance over the entire 25 years. So if they didn't do it, we could deduct money from that availability payment. So they wouldn't be, we wouldn't be paying for something that we did not get. The idea is to build five to seven schools. Um, majority of those schools would be in the northern part of the county to alleviate the overcrowding. But there would also be some other schools that would be built that could not otherwise be built to relieve some of the infrastructure issues that we have in the southern part of the county. We haven't identified all the schools because uh, what we're trying to do right now is develop uh, a, an idea of what the budget would look like. We're going to be hiring uh, P3 experts to help us come in and develop an RFP. Uh, and then once we do that, we'll be hiring bond counsel and also a P3 counsel to help us work through negotiations once we enter into negotiations with a provider. Um, this would be in, in also part of another aspect of what we're doing. So before, most of our CIP budget was built around a $425 million annual ask, which would have resulted in $20 million, uh, I mean $8.5 million over 20 years. That isn't going to happen. None of the politicians at either state or local level think that we could get that kind of funding. If you look at the funding for the state, they only give out about $400 million. Actually, they're going up. To 400 million dollars statewide this year but but in the past they've been somewhere around 250 to 300 million dollars so that money was never going to be available for us so what we've decided to do uh, and with your is to change the delivery system so some of the buildings as you can see in the yellow which is marked stage renovations they would be buildings that we could deliver earlier so instead of building new buildings we're finding buildings that are in good bones for lack of a better word um, that need updates. So we would come in with five different types of delivery systems, a healthy school system, which is the HVAC, the exterior envelope, windows, uh, your, uh, your plumbing, all those types of things, and replace those types of things. And that's a, would probably be one of your more expensive ones. But then you also have what we call core elements, which we would come in and work on the cafeterias, uh, change out the, um, uh, uh, the, you know, fix the kitchens, uh, fix the fix the uh, gyms uh, and that sort of thing, uh, the hallways and all that type of thing. 
Um, then we have what we call core classrooms, which is uh, another element where we'll come in and fix the learning areas. We will provide them with uh, uh, wiring for all the new technology. We change the lighting, which has a major impact on learning to make sure that we have uh, all the asbestos and all those other types of things are baited in those schools, make sure that they're painted freshly, bring in new FFE, so, which is furniture, fixtures, and equipment, so that we can utilize some of the new innovations that we have to make the rooms work better and to make students have more access for a better educational environment. Um, and, that's, and then we would have uh, safe schools where we would come in and do the security upgrades, uh, we do the redo the storefronts. We also have a safe passages version where we would come in and reorient the the, um, the exterior of the building, work on uh, the uh, driveways and parking lots so that they work better with our buses. Uh, those schools weren't always designed for walkers and and car drop offs, and we'd redesign those and repave them and have them so we'd have a safer school. Ultimately what we can do is we can do like 11 to 12 schools that way and that would reduce the overall capital spend that then if you look at the numbers in uh, black and white with the stripes that is the state bat matching funds right so what we would do there is we would orient ourselves towards the smaller schools to do our own uh, capital projects and by doing that we could um, then do more schools and get maybe a bigger match using some of the legislation that was recently put passed by, uh, pushed forward by Senator Rosenbaum. We would try to reduce the overall cost of the schools through innovation, not building inexpensive schools necessarily or cheap schools, but by using innovation to bring the cost of construction down, um, using some prefabrication in areas where it's, a bit, where it's possible, and we'd focus on the smaller schools where we could do that, which would give us a larger chunk of money from the state in comparison to what we normally would get to that project level. And we would also do a lot, some of the additional middle schools that are already got funding for, and we'd proceed with those middle schools in order to relieve some of the over, uh, in order to move forward faster to relieve the overcrowding. So we would do that. Now, what does happen is there is a shrink uh, in the overall amount of money that we're going to spend on uh, systemics, but we'd still have money for systemics. And that $50 million there for stage renovations, that's going to fluctuate. So some years we're going to have more for systemics, and some years we're going to have less. And it's going to fluctuate based upon the type of stage renovations that we're doing. And then finally, um, in regard to the, um, the P3, um, some of the money that we would go to the P3 would have to come either out of uh, our capital budget in order to uh, match what the county's funding is going to provide. We've only asked the county to provide $20 million in additional operating funding. We think that uh, they've mentioned, and I, and I think they're right, that we need to put some skin in the game in order to make the P3 um, you know, something that we're involved in and they're involved in and we're working together on. So. That's generally what we're doing with our new delivery system. You'll see that a lot of this stuff is outlined in um, our EFMP, um, which you you got here for First Reader today. Thank you, Sean. So quickly, we're going to touch on the third um, component of possible solutions that, um, that we're presenting. Uh, board policy. 8391 actually encourages the school system to maximize the use of its existing facilities through the reassignment of students from over-enrolled schools to under-enrolled schools. And this is a process that we've used um, continuously through the years um, to balance enrollment um, among our facilities. So um, this uh, map um, before you displays the boundaries for comprehensive elementary schools. Um, it's shaded by the utilization of each school building. Um, utilization, uh, of course, is the school's enrollment divided by its capacity. It's important to keep in mind that portables uh, are not included in the capacity. So a lot of the um, overcrowding, uh, as Ron mentioned, has been accommodated with, with the portables. Um, but it's not a permanent solution. Um, schools that are optimally utilized are shaded in yellow on this map, and um, those that are underutilized are in green, and those that are overutilized over are shown in orange and then red. Um, looking at the chart on the right, um, we see where we need seats. 
Um, collectively, we have an availability of seats south of Central Avenue, which we're showing in, in green. We're showing what we'll have available um, for this fall and then five years from now. Um, now, north of Central Avenue, we see a collective deficit of seats, which we show as a negative number in red. Um, so looking five years from now, we expect that this imbalance um, among uh, schools geographically will persist. Bless you. Um, looking at the same information for middle schools, again, concentration of overutilization above Central Avenue. Um, looking at the seats that we need um, for this fall, we already um, have a very small deficit of seats countywide, and we're projecting this to increase over the next five years. Again, remember, we have these larger elementary cohorts that are working their way through the system, um, and, and we're going to experience that in the next couple of years. At the high school level, again, similar picture, overutilization above Central Avenue. Uh, if we look countywide, we, we do have, for this fall, we, 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 we do have a, um, seats available uh, on balance. However, within five years, our enrollment's going to increase, and we're not going to have um, really any seats available at the high school level. But again, the enrollment imbalance between schools geographically it remains a challenge. Um, so quickly, on the, on the map in the middle of the slide, we see locations of schools that have a substantial amount of capacity available. In this case, um, we're using 300 or more seats available. There's five facilities north of Central Avenue, um, although three of them, we can see they're right there on the line. Um, uh, but collectively, there's, they ha there's 2,000 seats available in these five facilities. Um, however, going back to our previous slides, there's a deficit of over 5,000 seats among elementary, middle, and high schools above Central Avenue. And if we compare the, the middle map to uh, the one on the right, which shows all schools, again, it's the picture of where we, ha where we need the seats and where we have them is geographically misaligned. So I'm going to turn it over to Ron to wrap up. Thank you, Rihanna. Um, based on the current uh, enrollment projections and utilization challenges that we're currently facing right now, and will continue to worsen as the projections indicate in some of these areas, we recommend the next steps to explore some of the solutions that we mentioned here today. Um, and the first thing we like to do is form a committee consisting of school-based central staff, stakeholders, and community champions, number one. And we'd like to conduct community engagement meetings to share challenges and to gather feedback. And to sum up the presentation today, we see that there is a major disparity of available seats throughout the county. Traditional methods of maintaining optimal utilization at the schools will not work anymore. Port portable classrooms were used for many years to compensate uh, for permanent capacity. Um, but the school sites where additional capacity is needed does not have any more space to accommodate them. It's going to take a combination of the proposed, proposed uh, optional solutions to solve these challenges that we presented today. Uh, the implementation of multiple solutions is essential to use the capital funding more efficiently. Some of these solutions can be implemented much faster than building brand new facilities. And the final note, just to say that the school systems really have no control where people choose to reside, but is the responsibility of the school system to meet the educational delivery needs of our students. And that concludes our presentation this afternoon. Uh, we want to thank you for allowing us to share this information, and we reserve the remaining time for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for 
some of that informative, all of that informative and very important information. Um, I will open the floor to questions. I have so far in the Q. Williams, Wallace, and Boston, and Ahmed. And, and other people who I'll write down. Did you not buzz in? Did I miss you? Buzz? We're going to get started? Uh, yes, I'm sorry, okay. Ms. Williams. So thank you all for the presentation. You know, this is what I love about my job is when we're talking about school construction and population. Um, and I think you all did a great job to move us from understanding our needs for the facilities and pushing this uh, public-private partnership because I think it will be the best for the schools. Um, but if I understand you correctly, and just for clarity for those that haven't been in the detailed conversations, on the public-private partnership, the funding for that would basically come from the county and the school system. There would be no state money really directly involved in that. At the moment, no. There would be no state money. Uh, it would be a combination between us and, and the county. but. We, that doesn't mean that state funding is forbidden or that we're not willing to accept it, but mm -hmm. it hasn't been yet put on the table. We have. Right. So our initial um, entree into this will be county and state money. Yes. I mean, sorry, county and PGCPS. Um, yes. And the, for clarity on what was just passed, that focus is on the facility specifications, or is there something else involved in that? So there was a, a myriad of, fund, of legislation that was passed. I think there was some presentation at the last board meeting about it. But basically, for us, what's most important is there's a lot of flexibility given in uh, Section 4126 of the educational um, articles that gives us more freedom related to um, alternative financing, mm -hmm. uh, different means of purchasing buildings. Um, they expanded the definition of what an alternative purchasing methodology would be mm -hmm. to give us the opportunity to do a private partnership, a P3. Uh, we had a lot of consultation with Senator Rosenpep and the people that were uh, putting together the legislation. And so it expands the, the types of, um, of transactions that are allowable under state law. And so that gives us a lot more expansion. In addition, they have a, uh, a new pilot program, which three counties, of which we are one, uh, can participate in, which means that if we can uh, produce uh, or come up with a, a budget for school buildings that is 30% below the rolling average for that type of building, that this, the state will provide us with a ma uh, matching funds of 80% of the total cost of the building. Mm -hmm. So to give you an example, if you have a building that uh, roughly cost about 34, 30, $33 million, then they would be able to give us roughly around $25 million of that money to build that school, which is an increase from where uh, we are now, where right, it's 63% or a little bit less than that. Okay. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. The difference between the public-private partnership and our traditional method is that when we open the school, we will not have paid for the school 100%. That would be correct. Um, depending on the transaction, uh, the one that we're looking at right now would be in, involving, a, again, uh, an availability fee, which means that we're paying for the availability of the building to us. We would own it technically, um, but the cost would be spread out over 25 years. And what we're actually paying for is actually the availability to that building to be able to use it as it's intended. If it does not work as it's intended, we can reduce the amount of money that we pay to the concessionaire or cons that would build the building. So we would be, we would have a mortgage on the property versus now when we walk into the school, there is no mortgage on the property. Uh, better Kinda than a mortgage. Kind of sort of like. Yeah, it's like a mortgage, only better. Mm -hmm. Because let's say you build, right now if I build a school building and something goes wrong with the HVAC system or there's an issue with the HVAC system, which has happened. And so if you go into the building, uh, we're responsible for trying to get it fixed and take care of it and all that sort of thing. But if, if I have a moment of, of where the, the building isn't either cool or hot like it's supposed to be, 
we can reduce the amount of money that we're paying the concessionaire. Mm -hmm. So if we're paying them $25 million a year and part of the and there's a and they don't meet their goals, we might be able to knock, you know, a million or two million off that and claw it back mm -hmm. and use it for something else. So with the large percentage of schools that we have that are aging and the staff that we have to facilitate those maintenance issues, when we have our crisis in the summers and in the winters, we would be calling on that partner to come in and deal with that, not our staff. Hopefully there will be no crises, well, I'm but hoping. if there were, uh, yes, they would be responsible for fixing it. Mm -hmm. And if there were a crisis, there would be a reduction in the availability fee. Okay. Um, my question is, this is directly for District 9. I know that Stephen Decatur and Gwen Park High School were on the list somewhere, and is that being looked at as part of the? There will be no right now. There are no changes okay. to the the, the um, timing of that. to the timing of things, mm -hmm. except that um, we're, we're we haven't made a firm decision on which schools specifically will be part of the P three. Okay. So there is we're, we do want to address some infrastructure issues mm -hmm. um, that cannot be addressed with matching state funds, so mm -hmm. they would be put into the P3. So we haven't determined exactly which school buildings that will be. Mm -hmm. So I, I couldn't commit at the moment, but I we are looking at buildings like those as part of mm -hmm. uh, the P3. The pilot program. So just one more thing on this, and then I'm gonna move to another subject. Um, on the funding, if we're just looking at county and, and school money, we would continue to receive a similar amount from the state as we always would. Yes, it would be unaffected. Okay. Um, so the next conversation is um, regarding population. Um, on slide six, we talked about the, um, the projections of elementary, middle, and high school. Mm -hmm. And we're talking, we're looking at a seven year period for that. Um, can you talk about Explain how you come up with the projections. Um, how do you formulate those projections? And how does current development that's under construction come into play with that, those projections? Okay. So um, for enrollment projections, we use what's called the cohort survival uh, methodology, mm -hmm. which is a standard methodology that almost every school district in the United States uses. And um, it's based on three had basically three inputs, which is um, births. Mm -hmm. um, so comparing how many children are born in the county and then how many come to school, uh, enroll in, in school five years later. Mm -hmm. um, it looks at the um, ratio of how students, once, once they're in the system, how they move mm -hmm. um, from grade to grade. And generally, kindergarten to eighth grade, it's one hundred percent so on average mm -hmm. so if you know if we have um, 10,000 kindergartners we'll probably have right around 10,000 first graders mm -hmm. the next year looking at our history we're very s stable in that sense um, and the third um, input into the projections is as you said um, development mm -hmm. so um, in incorporating development, we generally, generally use um, what we call pupil yield. Mm -hmm. So looking at a certain housing type um, and on average how many students um, tend to come out of that housing type. Mm -hmm. um, and it has been challenging um, in the last few years because of the housing foreclosure crisis. Mm -hmm. um, so much of the construction that was expected just sort of disappeared, um, and, but now we're starting to see a more regular um, pattern um, that matches more historic um, trends. But those are the three main inputs into how we project the population. Right, so being that we're, we're such a large county and we have in some areas more tra transient population mm -hmm. and in other areas we have uh, more stable population. Um, the prediction for, and I appreciate you all coming to the Akakeek Academy Boundary Tra Task Force meeting, helping to you know um, pass information along to the community because it's been very helpful. We're beginning to see a boom in District 9, mm -hmm. um, and we know that some of these developments have been on the books for years. 
And we don't know how long they're going to, are they going to complete it, you know, now, or are they going to just do a phase and then 10 years later do a phase? Mm -hmm. um, how often do you look at those projections? And I'm going to go into now the operational side. And it feeds into our student base budget projections. Mm -hmm. How often do you look at that? And how does that play into the conversation? In particular, I'm looking at the, the more stable communities with development. Mm -hmm. How do you look at that? And how often is that projection modified? So we update them annually. Mm -hmm. um, so every year we're looking at so for example, with the development, we'll look at how many units did they build and how many students um, you know, came into the, a given school mm -hmm. from, from that development. So it's constantly being updated and, and changing. Now, the, we project for 10 years. Mm -hmm. At the state level, they only really want up to seven years because once mm -hmm. we get into out years, it gets you know, a little fuzzy. Um, and regarding the student-based budgeting, um, they use the, the first year of our projection as the base for that. And there's a whole, I don't have to tell you, there's a whole, the whole enrollment balancing process, classroom balancing process that adjusts um, for, for that. But that's the, the starting number, so mm -hmm. to speak. So, with, and I'm going to be quick, the conversation between from year to year in the conversation with projecting um, what's available. I'm talking about our underutilized schools in that area. The conversation with the transfer office when we have open transfer season, are you all involved in that conversation at any time? We are. So um, the procedure for, policy procedure for mm -hmm. um, the transfer office states that you, a school must be um, less than 90% utilized. So again, looking with their projected enrollment, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we get that first year number, we compare it to their state rated capacity. Mm -hmm. And if they throw, fall below that threshold for utilization, then they're considered open for transfers. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the transfer office, you know, goes at the, to the school level and looks grade by grade because mm -hmm. the, the utilization is such a broad measure. Right. Um, and then they determine how many seats are available at each grade right. level. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Williams. I went over to, I just was waving to Aisha. I said, she's got four minutes left. <laughs> it was four seconds. It was four seconds. It was four, it was four seconds. So you, you want to use that? You, you want to reserve that four seconds for the next round? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Wallace. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, administration, for presenting today. A um, couple of questions. First one, I guess it's an easy one, I'm being district specific as well, like my, my colleague, and just get a quick update on what's going on so far with Suitland High School. Whoever can answer that, I don't know if that's Ms. Chase. Yes, oh, I'm gonna get Beth up here. <laughs> I know there was an architect just announced by Mr. AJ. So for the record, Elizabeth Chason, CIP officer, um, we have hired the architect, so we're very excited. Um, they are Cox, Gray, and Spake. And they um, actually designed uh, Duke Ellington uh, Performing Arts School in DC. And they're getting ready to do the feasibility study. So the committee has already been set up. Um, we've met with the committee. Now the architect's going to meet with the committee. And they're basically going out and looking at site conditions right now. Awesome. And do you know when that feasibility study will be complete? We expect it anxious to take four to six months. Okay. It, it, because the campus is so large and there's so many components. Awesome. Thank you very much. Okay. And then on that same note, on slide 18, if we can have, go back to slide 18. I'm, a, I'm trying to picture where Suitland High School is and its boundaries. So I'm assuming, of course, it's below Central Avenue. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not quite South County, right? So I always say I dare not put Suitland Maryland in the same conversation as Baden right. or Brandywine, like Maryland. Baden, right? mm -hmm. um, but I do see that it is projected to be underutilized. Is, is, am I getting that sense that the new Suitland High School will be 
um, a much smaller building, a much smaller campus, housing less students, similar to what happened with Oxen Hill High School? Um, not necessarily, <laughs> and that's why we're here today. Um, if we do not do boundary changes, it's close to what it would have to be because that's the size of the amount of students that are there right now. Um, in terms of when we closed Forestville, we moved a number of those students over to Suitland, and now it's more, it's closer to capacity. Yes. I know there was some talk of the arts. They're going to be on the same campus, so those students will count in the full enrollment? Yes, okay. they do. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, and then on slide, bah, 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 bah. slide 20, a couple of questions. Well, first, a comment. I'm always thankful that the administration is going to engage the community. Um, when you do, could, and maybe you can help me and my colleagues, because I get this question a lot in my district, the, the difference between an overutilized school and overcrowded classrooms, because I can have an underutilized school but still have 30 students in a class yeah. and a lot of community members and sometimes me as a board member right. not really understand you know why this school is not getting a certain amount of state funding because they're underutilized but I have parents that complain about my child hasn't gotten lunch in a week because lunch period is 30 minutes I got 500 students per lunch period it's an overcrowded <laughs> school so right the, if your child hasn't gotten lunch it's probably an overcrowded school but sometimes in underutilized schools, we have overcrowded classrooms, and that's due to an imbalance in enrollment. There's basically not enough children to have three classrooms per grade, right? Um, and we end up having too many children, like 30 per classroom instead of 23 or less uh, per, per classroom. Would, would that be more of a student-based budget? It, it is student-based budgeting, but that's what makes it so hard on a really small school, because if a large school, the difference between six classrooms and five classrooms might be a couple of extra students, right? But when you get down to three classrooms versus two classrooms, now you're talking about maybe 10, mm -hmm. and, and you can really feel the difference. Um, and that's the challenge that we have with smaller schools with student-based budgeting is then the art teacher might be half-time, the special, other specials might be half-time due to that. Awesome. And then on the formation of the committee, is this an administrative committee or are you looking for the board to spearhead this? Because we recently, in, in February, we passed a, a board policy that um, starts the budget and operations committee, not FAB and that oversees CIP and boundaries, whether it be a board committee or an administrative right. task we were, force? We were looking for it to be combined, that it would include some community members, um, some champions, as we call it, people who are very involved in the communities, along with um, central staff and school-based staff. Um, we were even thinking of two levels. Um, one would be an overall committee, and then the other would be the smaller focus groups when it comes down to a specific school talking about challenges at that school. Okay, wonderful. And I know there was a slide mentioning the academic programs, whether as a possible solution or the relocation of programs. I know there was the CTE task force that Ms. Boston, I think some other colleagues were on about maybe consolidating or putting them in specific buildings where students could transport there as opposed to having them sporadically around the district to reduce or uh, relocate students. Was that a, a major solution or something that should be um, put to the back burner? It's something that would help immediately okay. um, because building classrooms takes a long time, right? Boundary changes, we know that takes a long time. Community has to get very involved and, uh, in that and it might not even happen. Uh, whereas program changes, they can be done within a year. Um, And then, my, my second to final question, on slide 10, one of the proposed solutions was portable classrooms. I just want to know why. I don't, I don't see that as a, as a solution, putting students outside of the main school building and having to transition. But it's outside. a reality. It if, is you, a, if we don't want 30 to 35 children in a classroom and a school is overcrowded, then it's a reality that a portable classroom is the solution if we're not going to change programs, if we're not gonna do a boundary change, if we're 
not going to add classrooms overnight, which we can't possibly do, then you need a portable classroom for safe and healthy. Okay. Yeah. And perhaps you can answer, I, I got an email recently from a constituent. Um, and I thought I had the answer, but I wanted to get it from the administration. Why do we not just, if we know that the southern part of the county is a little underutilized and we have high school, uh, schools like High Point that can basically be two high schools, why don't we just shift everything down? Um, shift our boundaries, just shift them down. That, that is a possible solution, um, but it would take a lot of public will. I mean, think about all of the children who would be disrupted and whose boundaries would have to change to do that, particularly the children in the middle of the county, right, whose school systems might be more balanced right now. By shifting from the north to the central area, they would have to shift from the central to the southern area. So it's a lot more children than you know, if we just were to build a school, but we can't build fast enough. Okay. Wouldn't that be more cost effective? I know it's, it takes a lot of community will, political will, right? Um, but wouldn't that be a little bit more cost effective to yeah, just Yeah, the most cost effective solution is a boundary change, but it's the hardest one for everyone to I can, <laughs> I can only imagine. get behind. Um, would that be something that the, that the committee that's going to be formed that engages the community, would that be a topic that they discuss, maybe the, the will of the community to right-size their school district? Right, engaging the community. Uh, does, the, does the community have the will to see this through? It's a hard decision to make. Mr. Mr. Wallace, I would also just add that you can't ignore transportation costs either. If you start you know, moving kids from you know, overcrowded schools in the farther north, and as you know, they said, you know, down a couple of school you know, areas down and then down and then down, you're going to add a lot of costs and complications to our transportation issues. So I think transportation is a big cost. Yes. Thank you very much. And then last question was on, there's legislation that was mentioned. Um, I sit on Maryland Association Boards of Education, Board of Directors, thanks, thanks to my vice chair. Um, and one of the conversations that we had there was the Rosa Pet Bill, and um, a very unfortunate comment was made that they, they questioned why this county would want to have strip mall schools where everything is, you know, drywall, and they used the, the I think there was a, a school in Anne Arundel County that really had no windows for special education classrooms and it really wasn't conducive to educational needs. I just wanted to make sure that that narrative doesn't be, that does not become this county and that if we going, are going to use the P3 model, um, that we do it in a more effective way uh, so that that, um, that false narrative, I, I know that's not the, the intention of the bill, but that false narrative is not placed on this county. Well, just to, to, to a point, I received a couple unsolicited bids to help build some of the schools that we have on our list. Um, and we rejected them because they just didn't meet the standards that we had for schools. Um, the, the point of uh, the Rosa Pet Bill is to lower the costs and to reward us for lowering the costs, but you can lower the cost of a building without making a cheap building. And one of the things, to give you an example, there's uh, different slab technology now that, where you can pour the slabs and build the buildings a little faster. There are different choices in floorings that can save you overall money in, in, in the cost of a building. There are um, uh, prefabricated construction models that can be utilized that can save you the cost of construction, both in the cost of labor, the, the delays due to winter, uh, delays uh, that you receive, uh, that you see in, in a lot of construction matters because it's done off site and put in place. Um, there are all types of ways that we're exploring to lower the overall cost of construction without building a cheap school because every student in this whole county deserves to be in a school that functions right, that's comfortable, that has good lighting, enough space for them to do the things, and is shaped to function within the programming that the academic people put out there for them. And so that's the point of a school. It's to educate kids, not to, be, not to house them. And so that's what we're trying to build, schools, not just buildings. And I, and I think that, you know, on that note, you know, you heard uh, 
you heard him say, uh, if you save money against like buildings, because there was a lot of concern in the early iterations of that bill that focused on a per pupil cost. But when you compare some of the smaller high schools we have, um, some of our charter schools, for example, who do not have the athletic programs and the athletic facilities that we have, and you do a per pupil cost, and you're not factoring in things like competitive gymnasiums and varsity athletics and football stadiums and lacrosse fields and you know all of those kinds of things that's that's not fair to kids who are going to be compared and, and it went right back to this cheap building versus a lesser expensive version of a school that meets the functionality needed by the school thank you I yield back thank you uh, I, I have miss Boston I, I, I want to say in you know, we keep ourselves on a five-minute timer, but not you guys, because we want good answers from you. However, you can feel free to think of yourselves as being on a five-minute timer <laughs> as well, so that we can get through. <laughs> so that we can get through this uh, 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 as expeditiously as possible. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Oh, I'm gonna try to be brief. Um, I have pretty much. Uh, really one question, but before I do that, I, I, I'm sorry Mr. Wallace left out of here, but um, there, other than the committee that he mentioned that, that you're putting together to work on some of, uh, of this, on, on the CIP part, um, because of the result of the, um, some of the legislation that went through, I think we're also working with doing an internal and external group as well to look at some of the, um, how we do some of this work around C, uh, you know, capital improvement and CTE. So some of these suggestions that you see here are some suggestions that we had an inter, uh, uh, a, a conference call and some of those things were suggestions in that as well. And I'm, I'm glad to see that you've already incorporated some of that. So there will be two, two different committee reports that's gonna come out about some of this work and how we can do it much more um, uh, efficiently and um, cost savings for for the for the system. The question that I have was on just to mind the question because you may explain this to me on, on on slide 19. I see you listed John Carroll Elementary School as being um, had available seats, but I don't want to give us a, that's no longer a elementary school. That's an office building. So uh, I'm just trying to was that a mistake? So, slide 19, please. So, it, it was not a mistake. Um, it is being used as an office. Um, the intent of this slide is, and the reason we included it, to show that there's not a lot of good options. Now, if you had, um, let's say, a tremendous crowding in that area, potentially you could convert it back to a, to a school. Right now, that's not really where, where our over-enrollment is concentrated. Um, so, it, you know, we, we wouldn't necessarily use it for that, but it was kind of reiterating there's not a lot of good options. So pretty much you're saying that you would have the option to slash use it as an office building and classrooms? No. no oh. it, you would convert it back to an elementary school, potentially. It's just an, it's more of an example. So the, um, then it's kind of a suggestion. So the student, um, the student capacity for that school would be 469 students. That's what it was at the time that it was consolidated. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we did. We moved Tulip Grove, with under construction right now in the Bowie area, to mm -hmm. Meadowbrook. When we did that, we had to take the community and adult programs that were in that school and work with the city of Bowie and relocate them elsewhere in order to recoup that school. And it would be the similar kind of thing. We'd have to go to John Carroll and say, whatever's in there has to be put somewhere else if we need to use that school, if it would help us. Okay, so this is the only mm -hmm. only office space that we had that we could convert back? So why where we need single it. Out John Carroll? I think where we need it. We right. have some space in the county in schools like that where we don't really have a need for additional seats. Yeah, no. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ahmed. Uh, Mr. Kaufman, Ms. Chason, Ms. McCarter, Mr. Matlock, Chief Watts, thank you so much for what you do. Not a lot of time, but I really appreciate the work that you've done. I know that we have, I've seen a lot of you three um, through the Woodmore Feasibility Studies, and thank you so much for that. Um, I have a lot of thoughts. 
The first thing is on uh, PPPs. I'm glad that we're finally discussing this. I remember coming on the board in 2016, talking about alternative financing, talking about PPPs, and we've come a long way from there um, in a short, relatively short period of time. So I appreciate that, and I know that has been done because of a lot of collaboration on the state level and on the county level. Um, I did want to say I hope that that 20 to 25 million dollars that we're getting. Uh, or hoping to get from the county for PPPs will go towards a high school in North County. In my opinion, I think that that is probably our most dire need, uh, knowing how overutilized some of our high schools up there are. Uh, is there a plan specifically for where that 20 million or 25 million would go, Mr. Matlock? There's a sketch. So, and, and I think that's the best way to describe it. We are looking at the two high schools in the North, both High Point and the new high school as potentially being in uh, the PE3. Um, we're also, at one point we were thinking about the middle schools being in there, but then we've looked at maybe the fact that we've already got uh, matching funds from the state to do those, so we might not want to put them in there. And then we're looking at other locations in elementary schools that might need, have needs. So it's a sketch right now, but we are, we're, our focus is to relieve the overcrowding, and so those two high schools are definitely at the forefront of what we're thinking about. Okay, thank you, Mr. Matlock. You know where my vote goes uh, on that. Uh, another thing, and this is something that I was thinking about as you're presenting and showing these maps, um, have you all worked or thought about leasing or acquiring unused Montgomery County school buildings? I, well, in, in, the thought has crossed some people's minds. Um, there's transportation challenges, and also right where we're experience, experiencing a lot of overcrowding, they are too. They're right across the line, it's a, it's a similar circumstance. Um, so I, I would be surprised if there was, thing, if they, you know, if there were facilities available over there that, you know, they probably had already either looked at acquiring them. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, yeah. but they're having the same problem we're having. It's just that I'm looking, so I did a quick, quick Google mm -hmm. search on some of this, and I saw there that their middle school utilization is either underutilized or at point, um, and their elementary school is either at point or underutilized in some areas around our border. Mm -hmm. And then I looked at the last publicly available information that I could find from 2014 that showed at least two buildings that are being leased by other organizations in Montgomery County, where these two schools, elementary school facilities, are within 10 minutes of Adelphi and Calverton, which is at our northern end. So it's just something to consider, and I would love um, for some uh, maybe analysis or report or uh, feedback from you all on whether or not those or something like that would be a viable option, especially maybe even in Howard County, who knows, you know? Um, and my request is if that information could be looked at and brought back to us as a board, uh, perhaps, I, I don't know, is next meeting too early? I only know that, I'm only saying that because the EFMP is on the agenda, so it might be a timely opportunity. What do you all think? Well, um, that, that might be too quick, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, given uh, that there are a lot of competing things that are going on with the, within that sphere. It's, a, it's an idea we should look at. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and we will certainly take a look at it. Transportation and, uh, and moving children out of, uh, in, in certain ways, is, is a, a real issue. Um, uh, I happen to know because I, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, I've been involved with a lot of the contracts and things related to the school system, that it's very difficult to find buses and things like that. For, for to move kids around. So the transportation issue might be one real problem for us. Oh, I hear you about that. I just saw, I thought since it's so close to the border that maybe it wouldn't be as big of a transportation issue as uh, maybe further inward in some of those counties. Um, and then the last thing that I would, oh, we have a CIP meeting with y'all come August, right? Would that be a good time to maybe look at this again? Um, we can address it then. It's a great idea. Thank you for bringing it up. Okay, thank you, Ms. Chason. Um, lastly, around the portables, um, it's my understanding that this is the first year we're actually purchasing purchasing new portables, uh, and that was is is twenty five in the amount of ninety five thousand each, so around a little over two million dollars. Is that correct? 
Well, so uh, this is the first year in at least a decade we've purchased that many. Wow. And um, it's about $95,000 to install the, the, the temp itself, and then you have to put in furnishings and everything, that, you know, permitting and all that, yes. Okay. And so previously, did we just shift around our portables from one yes, area of need to... In the, in oh, the last no. five, ten years, we've been moving them from underutilized buildings to a, a building that uh, is now overutilized, if you will. Yes. Oh, gosh. So that's, that really is concerning to me because I feel like we're fighting for scarce resources, scarce resources instead of investing in getting some more of these needed resources. And I understand portables are not ideal in any way. Um, but if we're in this situation and we're busting out the seams in some of our uh, elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, then you know this is a need that we have. Um, and so my question is, is the system requesting more money from the county or from the state for portables? So we have not requested any additional money. We, we uh, came up with a, a variable how many we needed in between 25 and 30, and we're working on that now. We have some that we're thinking about moving, and we have others that we purchased. Okay, and I guess just to give me some some framework around this, uh, approximately how many portable re requests come in from y'all, y'all, or f come in to you all every year? So we have a process in the spring where the instructional directors work with the principals and the associates, and they bring them to us. Uh, we sit down and we go through with um, the the projected enrollments and look at that. We also look at the classroom utilization. So if a school has uh, work rooms that they have that are not being used as classrooms, if they have multiple computer labs or, or, or computer labs that are, that are still running and we've provided uh, you know, multiple uh, lab uh, mobile carts, things like that, we request that they break down those computer labs and use them for classrooms. Um, and, and, you know, in the cases that we've asked that, we've also provided additional computers, mobile cars, if necessary, if they don't have them available. Um, so we, we, we do a number of things before we, we put temporaries. And you, you're absolutely right. Temporaries is not a great investment for us. So we're trying to stay away from buying hundreds more. We're trying to look at future investments into our buildings so that, um, you know, we can, we, we can get out of the temporary business, if you will. Yes. Um, so my, I'm just thinking how many of our schools that require this extra space via temporaries, via portables, are not getting that space? And can so, we so request re that? requesting it and needing it are two different things in yeah. our opinion, okay? Are there any schools that are in need that don't receive it? Uh, we, can, I can, we can sit down and show you what our, what our information looks like. So that you can you, know, you can see that sure. Okay, I would really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, I just think if if as a board we have this ability to amend, add, change budget, um, and this is something that I think we should take into consideration when that comes up. Uh, is it possible for portables to be um, in the capital budget versus the operating purchased through the capital? No. No, uh, they don't meet the uh, requirement of a capital purchase. So it can only be done in operational funds? Yes. Oh, okay, I'm good, thank y'all. Ms. Page, thank you for your patience. Um, thank you for your presentation. I have a few questions, the first being on slide five. Um, it says that we have 127,000 students enrolled. Is that just in our K through 12 schools or in our entire county? So that, that's just grades K to 12. So it doesn't include um, pre-kindergarten, which is another 5,000 students. Okay, thank you. That clarified a lot. Um, my next question is in regards to slide 12. You said that, well, my question is, is the split in staggered start times already implemented? No. Okay. No, they're not. That, there are things that other districts in the United States have implemented. Um, to help relieve overcrowding. Can you elaborate on what split and staggered start times involve? So the, the, the first one, split staggered, the idea essentially is you bring 50% of your population in early, 
um, let's say for two hours, and then they, uh, at least some of them transition into the core spaces. So it's lunchtime, it's gym time, where you, you, you can, um, you have fewer students in the classrooms, and then you bring 50% of the, the other 50% of your population, let's say in two hours later, they go into the classrooms while the first shift's in the core spaces, and then um, the first shift goes home, and the late shift um, then goes to lunch, gym, those sort of activities. So I'm assuming this would be implemented in elementary schools and middle schools? Um, high schools and middle schools w were the, the focus and in, in terms of looking at other districts, it's really been in, in the middle and high schools where it, it's been used. Yeah. I'm it's, curious how you would implement it in high school because everybody has different schedules. Can you elaborate or give me some examples? So typically in a high school, right, 100% capacity means that you're at 85%. They use the classrooms 85% of the times and often teachers use a classroom for um, lesson prep, et cetera. Um, So when is the ideal time this will be implemented? So what is ex the um, ideal time it will be implemented? So this, this again, th this is really meant to be um, just an overview of solutions that other districts have used. So we don't really have the details of when it would be implemented or, you know, just something we should explore. You know, Denver um, schools has utilize that when they um, couldn't get enough capital funding for a new building. Um, there, the Montgomery County um, Office of Legislative, Le Legislative Oversight did a report last year um, that, that went over a, a lot of these things. That's something we could share um, or that's available online. Is, is, that's an interesting thing that explains a lot of these items. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Colleagues, I have a special suggestion that came from my colleagues. A couple of our colleagues have to leave for some super special reasons. Um, and we want to, they uh, really want to vote on our first reader items before they leave. Is there objection for me suspending this uh, uh, discussion just for a few minutes to go to new business 9.0 first reader is there objection I, I, I will ask for those of my colleagues who might be in the back of the room watching us on TV to come on out so that we could do this do you get you okay I'm just ready to make my recommendation oh, ready? Sir. I'm just I'm just leaning you're in I got go. my mic on ready to go just call on me Okay, so without objection, we will suspend and move to item 9.0, new business, first reader. I'll yield the floor to Dr. Maxwell for an introduction of items 9.1 to 9.4 under first reader. Thank you, Dr. Eubanks. Items 9.1 and 9.4 require board approval as first readers. Thank you, colleagues. May I have a motion to approve items 9.1 through 9.4 under first reader? Motion. Second. It has been moved and seconded to approve items 9.1 through 9.4 as first reader. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. Thank you. That motion carries with a special uh, thanks for item 9.4, community schools. Thank you, yes. colleagues. Dr. Eubanks, you, you don't want to hit the other ones real fast, too? I don't, I mean, unless you think there's a lot of, of uh, um, challenge to them. Folks, you want to try for consent agenda and uh, and budget consent agenda? You guys stay. You guys stay. Come on, might as well get it all I, done. I can hit them all in one thing if you want. Go ahead, do item uh, five point one requires board approval of a proclamation commemorating National Caribbean American Heritage Month. Item six one to six three require board approval of the June eighteen expenditure requirements, USDA commodity processing, and the declaration of covenants for uh, Bladensburg High School fiscal year fifteen SSR. Uh, phase two and item 9.1 requires board approval. Oh, I already did 9.1. Never mind. Eight point, I'm sorry, 8.1. No, we're not going to do second reading I, because, huh? because because I just want to make sure we might, in case we have a discussion for a second reading, we'll just take. Okay. We'll just, so, and I'm going to do 5.1 separate just because our student board member can vote on that. I'll take a motion for approving item 
under consent agenda. So moved. It's been moved and seconded. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. No. I'm Thank sorry. you, that motion carries. I will now take a motion to approve items 6.1. Yes, sorry. No. 6.1 through 6.3 under the budget consent agenda. So moved. May I have a second? Second. It has been moved and seconded to approve items 6.1 through 6.3 under the budget consent agenda. Um, do I get a call to roll on this? Ms. Berkeley, would you please call the roll? Ms. Ahmed? Aye. Ms. Boston? Yes. Yes? Yes. yes. This budget consent agenda. <laughs> Mr. Burroughs? Aye. Ms. Eubanks? Ms. Quintero Scrady. Aye. Ms. Rose. Aye. Mr. Wallace. Aye. Mrs. Williams. Yes. Dr. Wiseman. Dr. Eubanks. Yes. Ten eyes. Thank you. That motion carries. We will, we will bring back uh, uh, the uh, second reader when we finish our discussion item. So we will come back to discussion. Um, and where we left off, did you, were you done, Ms. Page? I thought you, Ms. Page. Yes, Ms. Page, we, you were done, right? Okay, thank you. Um, oh, God, I was next. All right, a couple of quick questions. Um, one quick question, one quick comment. First question, is in your the slides 16 through 18 which do the enrollment projections the, the balancing enrollment projections are those uh are those projections of seat shortages um taking into account new, the new new buildings that we are building or are they not taking those into account so they do not take those into account okay. So in theory, if we get a couple of these buildings built, uh -huh. then, that, then, then that number would be significantly less. Okay. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. The only other thing I gotta bring it up for my, for, for my friend, Dr. Max, we've had some kind of great conversations about Rosa Pep's bill and about new school construction. Um, and I would just kind of um, uh, um, point out to my friends that, well, some of, uh, uh, Senator Rosa Pep's ideas are stretch the limit of feasibility. You know, w myself and some colleagues did visit that school in Anne Arundel uh, that was built under Dr. Maxwell's watch. Um, we've been to, we've seen the new CMIT that they built and so much that we learned from charter schools, um, the, uh, uh, the College Park Academy and what they built. And so while we know that we, that that there's, that there's that extreme, I think the future of our school buildings need to be thought dramatically different than what's traditional. So one of my favorite examples is that the traditional uh, requirement for school buildings is that they have a 40 to 50 year lifespan. To me, that's crazy for two reasons. The first is this, we have no idea where people are gonna be 20 years from now and 30 years from now. And, and residential shifts happen so quickly that a 50-year building, you have, you, there's no way to predict whether it's gonna be undercrowded, overcrowded, or needed at all. And the second part of that is what we know about human nature and how our schools go. Every building past 30 years old, everybody in the community hates. There isn't a single 35 or 40-year-old building in this county that isn't under constant protest for it needing to be torn down and rebuilt. So you know, if we were building buildings that had a 20 to 25 year life cycle, why wouldn't we do that? And if we did, we can build them with different kinds of materials and build them in different ways. Uh, and so I just think we need to be a lot more, a lot more creative than we are. Maybe not Jim Rosapep creative, but significantly more creative than what is, than what we're currently doing. And so, and I know you were, we're really being thoughtful about that. All right, so that's it, you know, and that, I like the length of your commentary and it means you agree 100%, okay. Next. No, don't. No, no, but we're short. <laughs> All right. Ms. Roach. 
Um, thank you all for the presentation and your work. That, that was great information. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, do you have an estimated timeline for the committee and community engagement work as next steps? So it will take place over this year. We'll start the summer through the fall and into the winter. Okay. Um, I guess I would just encourage you as you get feedback from the community, um, not only on kind of what to do, but also the process, so how to inform people and how to show that feedback is incorporated and whatnot um, that you guys are already um, working on. Um, and for Schedule changes, I know you guys explained the split staggered start times and morning and afternoon shifts. That would be another question I would encourage you to um, engage the community around, you know, what, which of those options would um, really minimize the burden on parents and students the most? Um, and then the last question is, I think um, I heard mention that portables are not included in the capacity. Can you explain that? Because I, I know we don't want per portables as a permanent solution, so. So um, the capacity, we use the state's um, calculation, um, which is standard across Maryland, um, and it only includes permanent um, infrastructure. So they sort of don't let you hide overcrowding by, by if, if you included the portables in there, um, those numbers would look better, um, but they wouldn't tell the real story. So that, that's sort of the, the idea behind not including them. But again, that's the state's formula and method. Okay, that, that helps, because the way I was thinking, it, I was worried that by not counting them, those schools are not as, uh, as high on the priority for but it, with your explanation, it sounds like the opposite. Right, right exactly. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Ms. Grady had to go, so uh, I have uh, round two, Williams and Ahmed. Ms. Williams. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> On the boundary discussion, um, how does this conversation and timing for this relate to the boundary discussion that we're looking to have in the fall? How does that work together? So as, as Ron mentioned in the beginning, it's we really need a combination of all of the items that we d um, mm -hmm. discuss, different combinations. We don't know what they're going to be yet. Um, but as we know, the boundaries take, take a while, mm -hmm. and um, generally they're voted upon um, in the fall or in the early winter mm -hmm. and for implementation the next school year. Mm -hmm. So that's the quickest that we could do anything on, on those. So, so I think, you know, embedded in that is the only time, often the only time we talk about these issues is when we have this school community mm -hmm. being proposed to you to move from this place to that place and all of the drama and the mm -hmm. hurt and the you know turmoil that kind of comes with those decisions. So we wanted to try to paint a picture for you of when we start having these conversations with people, we're looking at these issues of capacity now, capacity down the road, where we have space, where we don't have space, that we're looking at you know, creative, you know, different kinds of opportunities and do it outside of school A mm -hmm. and school B and school C. So that, so that when we get into those tense conversations, you have this information to say, well, we understand there's really an issue here and we do, if we're gonna solve it, we have to figure out a way to solve it and not just keep kicking the can down the road, and these are the things that, that go into it. So we just really want to have an opportunity to give you an overview of the issues that our county, as a county, faces without a decision pending and, and, and has to happen in this period of time, but to give you time to think and chew and you yeah. know, ask questions before that process comes before you. And that's understood. But if we're talking CIP boundaries, because this is really more related to CIP versus boundaries, even though they relate. Um, the question 
the more direct question is, can we expect a boundary discussion in the fall? Or is that being put on hold? No, I, I think we're going to have a boundary discussion in the fall. We didn't really have much this year, but I, I, I believe that we're planning to have a boundary discussion and have some community meetings over the summer. Mm -hmm. And I know we said fall or early winter. We've right. been trying to move away from getting it in that same time frame as the budget and exactly. get it done in the fall so that people have the ability to make those decisions about other choices and, you know. Correct. You know, magnets and all those kind of things. So, so I think that we have a number of them that we've been kind of holding on mm -hmm. while we put this together and that I believe we're going to yes. make some proposals so, early in the fall. So Ms. Williams, these stakeholder meetings that we're going to have, we're going to discuss not only the boundaries, but, but also these alternative methods, mm -hmm. what we need to do, because this isn't just a one school problem like Dr. Exactly. Maxwell was you know, uh, stating. This, this is going to affect the northern end of the county mm -hmm. and, and possibly you know a couple other areas as well mm -hmm. depending on how we how we solve this problem right so, so if we look at at impact a boundary change is a more immediate impact on student population in the school CIP is a more long-term fix that will give us a long-term effect on students in the school so when we're talking about the boundary discussions in particular in the southern part of the county where we're not looking to jump into the, uh, the, the larger pilot, we have to drill down into those schools. So the conversations with the community could expect to happen when? So we'll begin these, these uh, stakeholder conversations in the summertime. Mm -hmm. Okay. And basically work through the fall mm -hmm. with bringing recommendations in the early winter to the board, you know, for approval from the superintendent. But the longer ones will continue a while. Yeah, the longer ones. And the continue. idea is to try to accelerate that longer term problem of capital and make sure. some of those faster. Yeah, I think it's great to this public private partnership, um, what it does to free up um, maintenance dollars to help with some of the aging schools. But again, that's sort of a medium, if we look at boundaries as immediate, CIP as long-term, that's sort of a medium yeah, and fix we, in there. We may be able to use programmatic as a, as a helpful solution yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I know we approved the EFMP for, you know, um, second reader to come in a couple weeks. But this, I think, ties into it. When we're talking about school consolidation, in the EFMP, it touches on boundaries and, and moving students around to consolidate and more balance out the, the population. Um, what is being done to support that uh, consolidation and to move students around? Are we using boundaries as that or are we using programs or a combination of, of the two? Do you sort of get what I'm asking or do I need to? So I'd say, I'd say a combination of of those things in, in the sense that where we've placed some program choices like Duval High School for example the aeronautics program we spoke about earlier an under enrolled school sandwiched between two over enrolled schools and trying to draw kids from you know outside that school's boundary to that school that's a programmatic answer to that program um, but we also have had some where we do school consolidation things Forestville High School is is one of them and we're not and, and Skyline and a couple of the other schools, uh, Claggett, was it Claggett? What did we close? A couple years ago, you know, we Skyline. closed some schools and moved kids to other schools to get better capacity and better efficiency out of running those buildings. So, so we've been doing a combination of those, but we've tried not to get too far ahead of ourselves in some of those things because, you know, again, we, some of them are very helpful to do. Some of them create other kinds of issues as we do them. I, I think when you look at these long range, uh, views of what the population looks like at high school, middle school, and elementary school. We already need seats. We need 2,000 seats in middle school right now for every middle school we have. So we have seats maybe in the south end, if you will, but, but we need more. You know, we, we could move all the kids around and we'd fill them all up. So, so we have a lot of, a lot of uh, challenges with that. So before we jump ahead of ourselves, and decide, hey, to consolidate here, consolidate there. We have a large population shift, you know, a large population that we have to deal with that's gonna grow, uh, especially at the high school, and right now at the middle school, it's, it's already there. Thank you, Ms. Ahmed. 
Uh, just two points. Is it possible, and to build off of uh, Board Member Roach's point about uh, the portables, is it possible for us to see a map with the portables taken into account? A utilization map with the portables taken into account. So we have a uh, we have a list of schools and how many portables. Would that be helpful? I think it would be helpful to visually see how many schools. Okay. So so um, it might be a little bit more. We'll work, work on that. Sure. Okay. Thank okay. you. Um, and then for the committee, I'd love to help however I can. Let me know. That's all. That's all. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this extremely valuable information. Um, we appreciate it and appreciate all of the hard work you do and look forward to uh, uh, really moving to the next level. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see, we complete, okay, I give them a. Um, we, we have left item 8.0, second reader. I will yield the floor to Dr. Maxwell or to Dr. Goldson for an introduction of item 8.1 under second, new business second reader. Thank you, Dr. Eubanks. Uh, item 8.1 requires school board approval uh, for naming of the Fairmont Heights High School football stadium, the Coach Ralph C. Payton football stadium. Thank you, colleagues. We have a motion to approve item 8.1 under second reader. So moved. Second. It has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. Congratulations to the Ralph C. Baden football stadium at Fairmont Heights High School. Okay. Colleagues, follow-up items are for the April 24th, 2018 board meeting. Will be posted on board docs upon receipt. Colleagues may have a motion to approve items taken in executive session, session on Thursday, May 10, 2018. So moved. It's been moved and seconded to approve items taken in executive session as follows. Per, uh, personnel appointments, personnel matters, and administrative matters. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. Thank you. That motion carries. Colleagues may entertain a motion to adjourn. It has been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the brave souls who stayed to the end. Have a great evening. <laughs>